Well, go for it. How many I'm, people we got? A couple? Three, including me. Three, including you. Two. I have four. Four. We're growing. We're growing. Five. Five. One more. Uh, One more. Come on. Come on. <laughs> come on, people. All right. We'll, we'll start we'll it. Just go for it. Um, all right. Welcome, everybody, to Chewing the Cud. This is a weekly live stream where we sit down with you guys at the kitchen table and discuss things related and unrelated to regenerative agriculture. Um, the way these usually work is we'll start <laughs> with a topic for the week. This week's topic is water, specifically water infrastructure and the importance of that and things to think about um, when you're thinking when you're thinking about setting up your water on your farm or your ranch. Um, and so we'll go on that rant for the first chunk, 20, 30 minutes, however long it takes. And then um, the rest of the live stream is up to you guys. This is a Q&A format, comments, questions, concerns. You can yell at us, whatever you want to do, just throw it in the in the chat and we'll respond to everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's just start for those who are new. We'll start with some some brief introductions and and then we'll, we'll get on with our discussion about the the water the water. So yeah, my name is Isaac Tappenden. I'm from Michigan. Um, 19 years old. This is Ben Hawley. We're interns here at Green Pastures Farm with Greg Judy. Yep. Um, we run 370 head of South Pole cattle. Uh, 160 St. Croix sired hair sheep. We sell baling rollers. We give farm tours, host grazing schools, and Ben and I are here to learn what we can while we're here. We're actually here for two years. Mm -hmm. um, Greg and Jan offered for both of us to stay on an additional year just to kind of, you know, more experience under our belt. More reps. More reps. Yeah. And we both, you know, we both accepted. We're both staying on a another year. We're super excited for that. We will be bringing on another guy in April, April uh, March, well, 31st March 31st, March 31st, technically. So Connor, if you're out there, yeah. oh, he doesn't have an Instagram, but yeah. yeah. Anyway. Connor's coming and he'll yeah. be joining, joining, uh, well, I think probably. we'll be able to, I think we'll, be, we'll, we'll have to just zoom it out and squeeze him <laughs> in. Um, yeah. but yeah, that'll, that'll be <laughs> he fun. He just stand behind us. Yeah, exactly. Just he'll he'll just he'll just squat under the table, and whenever we need his input, he can he can lift his little head, his head up. up. Um, no. Uh, all right. So, in all seriousness, the the discussion for today is going to be water infrastructure, and um, this is something that um is basically like the most, more probably arguably the most important thing that you need to put thought into um when it comes to grazing systems, uh, because it dictates everything. It dictates where you put your fence. It dictates where you can, how you can graze. Um, it dictates what time of year you can graze. Um, it, 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 like, it, if you don't have water, you, you can't do it. Like, cattle need water. Sheep need water for the most part, except in the winter time. But we can get into that in a, in a bit. But um, yeah. So I guess, I guess the first thing we should discuss is like. So say you have had your, you just purchased a piece of land or you got a new leasing opportunity on a piece of land um, and you're trying to evaluate, you know, how you're going to graze it or, you know, where you're going to put your fences or whatever. Um, the first thing you need to be paying attention to is water. Um, yeah. So do you want to kick it off with, with that different sort of train of thought? Of water. Yeah, yeah. Or just like, like what you would be thinking about if yeah. like, if you, you got a new lease and you were just assessing like the water, you know? Yeah, you. I mean, the thing about the water, and you, and you kind of touched on this, is it's a lot easier to adjust your fence to where water points are than it is to adjust your water points to where your fence is. So that that means get your water in first, or where where your water is going to come from, and that can come from many different ways. If you're, if you're looking at cattle, um, you're going to need something that's you know durable enough that the cattle aren't going to tear yep, it up. That's a good point. Um, and, and capacity as well. And like capacity, it, 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 yeah, that's something yeah. you also have to think about. Is like, how are you running fifteen head? head? Or are you running three hundred and fifteen head? Or are you running a mm -hmm. thousand head? Mm -hmm. Like that's gonna dramatically change what kind of system you can use. So kind of kind of the basis with cattle or inlet sheep too, is there's two kind of ways you can go. You can go large volume with a slow refill, or you can go small volume with a fast refill recharge what that means is like let's say like for instance we have 370 head of cattle we have four like 400 to 800 gallon tanks placed around the farm that are hooked up to gravity flow from ponds 
and we'll get into that later. Um, and so we've got, you know, 800 gallons in these tire tanks sitting there waiting for the cattle to come. And once the cattle get there, they're going to start drinking. And there's, which in the, in the tire tanks, we've got a lot of recharge too, but we yep. wouldn't have to have since nope. we've got such a big reservoir. Yep. Whereas on the flip side, <clears throat> the farms where we have pressurized water, we use a, uh, in the summertime, we use a 100-gallon, um, I think a rubber, rubber Rubbermaid yeah. tank. Um, and that, but we've got, you know, whatever. Full, full, full bore like, pressure. I don't even know what it is. It's, it's like more than like, it's like, way, it's way higher pressure than you get like in your, in your house. house. Yeah. Like it's pressure reduced. It, it's like full, full blown, like pressure from like from, a, a from, water from, meter. from a water meter. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to say number cause I have no really. So like context. we, we, like we fill up when we're, when we're going to bring water sometimes with the dogs, we'll be filled up a five gallon bucket and it probably takes like. 15 to 20 seconds to fill up a five gallon bucket. I would say it takes, you could, you could, you can get you yeah. say 50 gallons a minute. I don't know. No, not, not no. quite. But anyway. how long it takes to fill up a full tank, probably at least three to four minutes. Yeah. So probably let's yep. say 25 gallons per minute. Yeah. Something know. like that. Something around it's, there. It's, it's got it's some good pressure. pressure. Yeah. It's enough to keep water coming in to keep up with the cattle drinking. Yep. Um, so in that scenario, Big there's flow. a, there's a small tank, but since there's such big recharge, yep. when the cattle are drinking, it's keeping up with them um, yep. filling it up. So you don't need a big tank yep. in that scenario. So those are kind of the two yep. ways you got to think about getting water. And then there's like many different ways to do that. Yeah. And um, and you're, and really something to think about as well is like the, the more flexible your water is as far as like the more options you've got for for the cattle to be drinking in different spots or maybe your ability to move that water around which we can talk about in a second um is gonna it's gonna allow you to graze that piece of land in a multitude of different ways and adjust mm -hmm. to different conditions a lot easier um and it's gonna allow you to sort of you know like like dictate where you want the animal density to be dictate like how 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 big or small or squared or rectangled or whatever like the the internal paddocks are like all of that is pot is possible that infinite flexibility is possible if your water situation is also flexible if you, which sometimes is not the case if you have like one central point because it's the only way that you're going to be able to get water out there like a pond or something like that or a big tank the disadvantage of that is there's only so many ways you can graze that paddock because they constantly have to have access back to that same point and you're always going to get preferentially higher animal density and pressure and uh like like whatever manure deposition grazing trampling that kind of stuff like closer to the water tank than farther away because the cattle are constantly walking back and forth and they're low effort animals like if they can if they can if they if they feel like that they're, they're good enough to just just graze one part of the paddock and it's too big and long away from the water they're not going to graze that back piece um but anyway, so I guess to get into some specifics, so we can talk about what we do here and then yeah. we can maybe list some other things. Yeah, exactly. So the, as far as there's, there's like, like two categories like you were talking about, there's, there's your, your big, like permanent infrastructure and there's, I guess three like surface water, which is like ponds or, or creeks or rivers or whatever. And then, then you've got like large reservoirs, like permanent tanks that stay in one spot. And then you've got smaller portable tanks that are hooked up to a pressurized water line. And, and so those are like the three different categories of, mm -hmm. of water that we use here in the farm. Um, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, and they work in different, slightly different scenarios. So we can just start with like surface water since it's the most basic. Yeah. So we have, we have, I don't even know, 40, 60 ponds something like that set around the farm different prop pretty close to one in each paddock or you could access a pond from each paddock almost yeah on the farm um there's some of some of the farms we've got permanent fence around the, the pond keeping the cattle out some of them we don't have permanent fence around and and uh the ones that we don't sometimes we'll use we will run up, you know, we have to run temporary wire around the pond in the summertime to keep the cattle out of the ponds. Cause that's as soon as you get your cattle in the pond, then you just ruin their drinking water. So keep your cattle out of the ponds, especially in the summertime, especially in the the summertime. wintertime. It's not as big of a deal. But the one thing you gotta worry about is if there's ice and, yeah. you, and you get a cow walking out and then falling in. But yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and then, so yeah, 
we, we uh, drink, let them drink from the pond, we'll just run the poly wire like into the pond about a foot. We'll step our posts in so that they can get their neck in there and get them a drink, but they can't go any farther in there. They get shocked if they on their neck if they go, they, farther, uh, go farther. And when you're standing in mud or you know water, yeah. wet, nice wet ground, that 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 really lets them know that they yeah they can't go any farther. And so that's what we use is surface water for ponds. We also uh, this this last fall, Greg's put in. Um, 10, 15. Yeah. We, we call them skirts. What, big, what he basically did is... It's like a boat he, ramp. Yeah, he... We had a... a, a we call it the Johnny Ardozer operator. He had his skid steer here. And he'd dig into the pond a little bit, and then he'd throw... He'd put some... It was a 8 to 10 inch... 8 to 10 inch rock. rock and then, down, and then covered it with 2 inch clean on top that, that sloped into the water uh, like 2 or 3 feet or whatever below like well below the lowest point of the yeah of the pond of the pond so there'll always be rock like regardless of how high or low that level goes in the summertime and so then we will fence all the way around the pond except for that point and we'll make a we could do like a yeah you've done a demo on your yeah on your yeah we, 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 we we've done a demo before but it's basically just like you you allow them it's the same concept it's an apron, as, we call yeah, it's it. an apron you, like you allow them it's the same concept as if you were a temporary fence around the pond where you're just letting them reach their neck underneath it's the same deal like you just have a little pvc float that's holding a wire out into the water so that they can only walk down that rock ramp and drink and walk right back out they can't mud up the banks of the pond and that's really the reason why the rock skirts have been conceived in the first place is because when it does get wet and soggy even like not even that soggy necessarily but just the ground is you know moist and and soft if the cattle are going to like the same spot and they'll do that like if you give them like a long stretch where they can stick their head under the water there'll be like two or three spots on that long stretch where all of the cattle will go and drink because it's the easiest spot to access and so you end up just destroying the sides of the bank and over time i mean the pond is just going to get filled in from the cattle like walking down in there and it's like it's just wrecking the the um pond ecosystem yeah the pond ecosystem and people and people will say like in the holistic management space or whatever that oh like you need like you need the animal impact to strengthen the roots on the edges of your of your waterways or whatever but that may be true but it's like if you there's, there's if you, a point where yeah. it becomes too much yeah Just and, like and, and it can happen so fast it's when, well when you're talking 370 head, head you need, they and, all need to drink and, and usually they're accessing that water point for like multiple days because there's a bunch of paddocks coming off mm -hmm. of that tank and so it's not like they're there for a couple hours and then they're gone mm -hmm. um and it's just enough time to anyway the 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 skirts is, is the solution to that and we still haven't really fully tested them out yet but um but they, they they look like they're they're going to be they're working work. pretty well um so the next step after that is all right you you could talk about creeks too for yeah surface, yeah surface so too. i guess and then it's kind of along the same it's lines. along the same lines like if you're going to water out of a creek if you can take some fiberglass posts and and drive you know like, or step in or step ins we've used step ins before but it's kind of nice to have it always mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. but you just find a way to get a like a skirt like a a, a temporary wire skirt out into the creek so that the cattle can come down the bank and go out into the creek and get a drink, but they can't like walk up and down the creek, um, and and so you can access access the creek that way. And then when you leave, that that access that water access point, you just take it out. You just take it out because when the creek rises up and you have four inches of rain or whatever, you're just going to lose all of that. But if you drive, if you, there's a way that we drive fiberglass posts into the creek that. Um, you drive them kind of at a slant so that if the current so, if something if the when the current's coming at it so then if something hits it, it it'll it just glance glances off, off. off of it. Um, but anyway, so that that's like another way of, of watering off of off of you know creeks or whatever. But it, I mean it's pretty basic with that kind of stuff. Like all you're trying to do is make sure that the cattle can't destroy their drinking water mm -hmm. and and destroy that ecosystem that's that's surrounding that riparian area um, and. And and it's free water. It's you know it's 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 rainwater for the most part, or spring bed and, or whatever. And oftentimes with what we're doing, we're moving them twice a day, so we will probably only be at a spot maybe max four moves, so two days yep. max usually. Yep. Um, just because 
the cattle will graze what's right there in that area and they need to be you know, we need to keep them moving yeah so we're, we're never usually there for more than two days in most circumstances there's there's some outliers but yeah, yeah. um and so obviously like in in the winter time especially in this part of the world those those winter water points don't work because they freeze solid mm -hmm. and so the for like or they can freeze solid depending, um, on, where depending on where you're at but like a solution to that is we've got these really large like permanent tanks and some of them are tire tanks which are these giant earth moving tires that are that are placed on like a concrete we pour we basically like place the tire tank pour sackcrete on the inside of the on the inside of the tank and there's a valve in the middle that we've already plumbed in there um, and then we pile rock on the sides of it, like gravel, and, and put landscaping timbers around that so the cattle oh, can... geotextile. Yeah, geotextile under there so the, the rock doesn't sink down. And the cattle walk on that rock and can get a drink from like an 800-gallon vessel that's sort of insulated by all that rock. Um, and those are usually fed from a pipe that's going through a pond dam. But the only way that you can do that, really, is if Before you, you build the you pond, build the pond, you build the pond. And you install the pipe as the pond's being built. Um, and and you can do the same thing like with just with just like a uh, like what is it pride of the farm the like giant what mm -hmm. is it six hundred gallon six hundred gallon six hundred gallon six tanks foot tank Gre Greg's had those in for twenty years and they're just now starting to fall apart thanks to me <laughs> um, well not really but. Um, but yeah no but they 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 lasted a long 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 time but it's the same concept where you've got a pipe running through a pond dam and then up into the tank with a float on it and so it's gravity fed but it's Serious, serious pressure because you've got, I mean, at most like 30 feet on one of these ponds, but like usually, you know, eight, 10 feet of water above it, which is giving you a, a pretty good amount of flow, especially if you have a two inch valve on those, on those ponds or on those like permanent water tanks off of ponds. Um, but the only issue with that is it's great for winter systems, but in the summertime, all of your all of your density is go is going right around those points on those paddocks. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way to take that water and put it somewhere else so that you it's can there. It's, it's there. Like and there's nothing you can do. And we Greg, long story, but there's concrete on some of those, like concrete pads, rock pads on the tire tanks. Um and that like prevents them from mudding up that immediate area. But all of the funnels going into those tanks just get like some serious impact on beat up. and beat up pretty More badly. than they should. Like yep. whoa. We grow, they grow a lot of weeds. A lot of weeds. Like rag weeds. It's actually an interesting like, like experiment to be able to see because if you yeah. look at an area that's so heavily trafficked like that, you can see what like an excessive animal impact does. Like when you destroy sod to that extent, you get to see like what grows. And then out in the pasture, you see what happens when you have proper management of density and and manure deposition and whatever um, and it's usually only it's not more than an acre yeah it's no, no, no. i mean it's not exactly much. it's not it's, it's not a crazy amount but, but still but the thing of it is is that impact that is getting right there it is not get, on the farthest point of the paddock it's not getting that's yep. where it's lacking if that makes sense like yep the impact that would normally be in the far end of the paddock is all put right, it's all right, put right, right by the water there tank, it gets so. redistributed unevenly yeah. throughout the paddock so you'll have they don't like to graze as the grass will become more mature. It doesn't have as much energy in it. So they don't like to graze it, much less walk. Yeah. Know? So. Yeah. It's like, a, it's like a, it's a, it's a positive feedback loop where you've got, you've got like the grass doesn't get the impact in the manure deposition and the massaging of the, of the soil microbes that you need to, to like grow a diverse, like nutrient dense, energy rich grass diet on that far end of the paddock. And so then they don't like to graze it as well because it doesn't taste that good to them. And so then it doesn't get the impact that it needs. And so it gets a more like grassy and lignified. So they don't graze it even more. And so you end up with this deteriorating section of your paddock because you have a permanent tank. Um, mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't adjust the way you're fencing that because you have, they have to have water. Um, so that's something to think about for sure. But the sort of not solution to that because it doesn't really work very well in the winter time because it's a huge hassle to do it in the winter time is, is your temporary portable infrastructure and so you want to sort of explain like yeah. what that is yeah so to get pressurized water you can either use um you know if, if like out here you've got what we what you call like rural water there's like three different um 
providers providers yeah. i guess um around the area that you know you pay like a whatever monthly bill and you you, you know you have pressurized water coming from these these towers or wherever they get it from yeah um it's, and it's it works like, just like a well it's just yeah. like you have to pay for it it's like and water then, going into your house yeah it's like the same sort of deal and then there's also you know you can get you can dig your own well it, it here you can't because of the way All like the, the groundwater is and just a lot of sulfur in the in the groundwater yep. it doesn't make you have to go down a long ways to get to any water and then when you do it, it tastes like it tastes sulfur, like sulfur. So. um but like back home like my my family we have a well um and we had you know we had to go to 70 feet or something and we had pressurized water and you know it's it's a cost but it's not it's it's definitely affordable for for a cattle operation that's looking to uh you know get some pressurized water get some water lines set out around the farm so what we do what greg does is he's he, on like different farms he buries a uh it's it's a high density high density polyethylene, polyethylene pipe, pipe. yeah he uses inch and a half it's i believe what is the it's a hundred and is 160 psi 100, 100 it's either 160 or 180, 180. i think is it's it? 180 psi yeah, I don't remember. I, like Anyways, it's either 160 or 180, but anyway, it's a yeah. yeah. So it's you know black polyethylene pipe. You can use it like I think Polyface uses it above ground. They they use it. And for all there's their, one farm that Greg yeah, uses it above ground. You can use it above too. ground. But Greg, uh, actually, I think on the North Place, it's actually PVC. You think? Because he remember you saying how he put it all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, but you can like, use PVC or the the poly the high density polyethylene is is probably a better, a better option. option. Um, and so, you know, you run up, you run a water line throughout your farm. You got to kind of, depending on the way, lay of the land and, and other factors, you got to kind of adjust and see where you want, kind of kind of plan that you can get water to every place, you know, be able to have a point where you can plug in and you can water all these different paddocks on your farm. Yeah. Um, what, what we use, what Greg uses for, uh, water like points or you know where you connect into is he does have some spots that had that he uses like a frost free hydrant although those can every can, single one of them leaks yeah i think every single one there might be a couple that they don't, don't most of them most of, most them, of them leak um he what he uses is uh plastin quick coupler is the name of the the device it's basically it's got a three quarter inch thread i believe and he puts a T in that black polyethylene that comes up like this, and the the plastic quick coupler female end is connected to that. It's got a little cap and like a little hole, and then you've got the male end hooked up to your hose up yep. to your tank, and you plug it in, it's, and it, and it does a like a little click, and you have immediate pressure. And as soon as you unclick the little the little hasp deal, it shuts it off, and you don't have any kind of spill or anything. Um, and so when your pipe is buried under the ground. You yeah, take like a like a like a big like six inch or eight inch diameter sewer pipe and you dig down and bury that mm -hmm. down the to trench. the line in the, in the trench. And so here, because the frost line is whatever three feet something yeah, it's like, like that, two feet. You can it's buried like two it's feet. buried like two feet under the ground. So you can reach your arm down there and plug in your male end, and you have immediate pressure and it's frost free. Um, and it costs like fourteen bucks the whole deal versus a a hydrant costs like seventy dollars or something like that. So it's definitely the way to go and, and it's super effective. Um, and then, and then what you do is you just have a long hose running off of that. Um, not a garden hose. Um, we, we use Rubber this hose. thing called like a flexzilla hose, which is like a lifetime guaranteed hose. Um, and if you got a long hose off of that, you can have like a massive array of locations where you can put that tank, um, and, and just completely change up the way that you're grazing it. Um, the flexibility of that in the summertime is just insane. And so the whole water kit, the tank, we use fiberglass posts to secure the tank like in the ground because otherwise the cattle will flip it over. So the tank, the fiberglass posts, and we have these big earth moving tire sidewall, sidewalls that we put around the tank so that they can step on the rubber and not like put a ton of pugging like right where the tank is. That and then like a post driver, and maybe a couple step-ins and a, and a crappy reel to just protect the hose. Um, all that just goes in a little two-wheeled trailer that then like lives out in the paddock 
and we just with the and we just drag that tank wherever the loaded up. It takes us like less than five, less than five minutes to break the thing down and set it back up again. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just moves super wherever the paddock simple. goes. Pa paddocks are it's super simple. There's a way you can make that frost free, and the only way you can really do that is if it doesn't get super cold where you're where you're at, and and during the daytime, you you pull a, a small siphon off of that tank and you run a long hose away from the tank so the cattle don't get like it doesn't get wet and muddy right around the tank and you just have like a pencil worth of water coming out or if it's really cold then you have to go full flow coming out of that but you're only going to waste a couple hundred gallons over the course of the day maybe um it was, yeah and it's like 200 gallons 200 or gallons something or something like that <laughs> if it's on full flow and your your tank won't freeze up during the day with the combination of the cattle drinking it and that constant flow going through it'll stay clear but in the at night, the cattle don't really need much water in the wintertime at night anyway. So you just dump the tank and take the whole thing inside. And so it's just a lot of like setup and monkeying with it where we only use that system when we have to use it in the winter. Um, in the wintertime, we rely a lot on those big permanent tanks because you don't have to monkey with them as much. You just have to chop some ice if it gets really, really cold, which mm -hmm. we had to do a bunch of. Um, mm -hmm. But that's sort of a good overview, I think, of like... I think so, yeah. Of like your of your water tank water systems and just remember that it's once you if you're trying to assess what to do with a piece of land like your one of your first things that, like near the top of your list is to be assessing your water situation and where that's going to go because you need permanent I mean, permanent perimeter fence to keep your animals in but beyond that your water is really going to dictate any other kind of infrastructure that goes in there um mm -hmm. so yeah i want to talk so a couple a couple ideas for like certain situations yeah um, absolutely different like different from what we do yep um so ian mitchell ennis from south africa in his scenario he's got i think it's fourteen thousand acres or something in, crazy. in south africa and he's got a river running right through the center of his of his ranch and uh what he does is he's got permanent paddocks going away from you know it's like split away from the river so that the cattle, you know, get to, they drink from the river for the first day. And for three days, they're, they're going back, walking back and drinking, you know, from the river. So they and graze away from the water Graze source. away from the water, then they move yeah. to the next paddock And then three graze days. away from the water and, source. And um, that's, I mean, you're going to see another, like we were talking about how the farthest paddocks aren't going to have the animal impact that the closest, closest paddocks are. But I don't think it's... It's, the, it's, it's like, also what your cattle are used to. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. like, Greg's cattle are spoiled because mm -hmm. they at most have to walk the farthest ones on marshals but that's an anomaly and it's going to be fixed once that pond actually fills up like francis's bottom like when they're down in there they have to walk all the way back up yeah when the when the creek's yeah. not flowing but anyway like that's an, an abnormality but usually they only have to walk like a couple hundred feet maybe a couple hundred yards to mm -hmm. water and if your cattle are used to walking like whatever a thousand a thousand meters 1200 meters 2000 meters in really arid environments like a mile and a half or whatever to water you can do that it's just like you have to have a breed that's used to doing that mm -hmm. and and the management style they need to be like they, they need to be used to doing that because mm -hmm. otherwise they're they're gonna they're just not gonna walk to go and eat they're, they're just gonna try to stay where they where they can drink and not have to walk too far but yeah um, well, well, there's a couple other things another one i was thinking of is I think is it is it Jeffers that has the reservoir up on their mountain or is it I, I think it's some, somebody somebody else Greg was talking. yeah yeah so there's a guy there's a ranch that Greg I think either you know did some consulting for or something he was telling us this ranch they've got a I say it's a mountain I think it's, it's like a six thousand foot drop like yeah. vertical drop it's a it's a it's a you know big peak and they've built a like a lake or a reservoir up really high up there yeah and they've got i think it's what do you say like a 12 inch pipe a gigantic pipe coming, coming off of it off of that reservoir you know down six thousand feet to where they're grazing and so they've got just they can push water for like, like they, a mile they have to something. pressure reduce that kind of stuff so that it doesn't, it doesn't blow, blow valves off mm -hmm. of tanks because it, what is it it's like every foot of rise is like like it's like through is like is it three no, 10 like a, feet is like 3 PSI or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. So it's like thousands of pounds per square inch of pressure that they're getting from, from mm -hmm. a 6,000-foot reservoir. But you could have a similar situation if you have like 
one really high point on your on your farm or your ranch mm-hmm. it it doesn't require that much energy even if you want it and you had to pump water up there it doesn't require that much energy to like pump it if you have a big reservoir you could use a really small like flow like going mm-hmm. up there and then the gravity flow pressure it's essentially Pushes working like a water else. tank yeah, yeah that gravity flow pressure then would push water to all of your water lines throughout your ranch if, yeah if you had like let's say you have a pond that's 200 feet below where you where your highest point is on your yeah. farm and so then you build this whatever 10,000 gallon reservoir yeah. up on your highest point of your farm you could put a little little pump in in your pond with a little like float deal that whenever that reservoir gets low it kicks that pump on and it's got a slow trickle pushing water 200 feet up into that reservoir and keeps that reservoir full all the time and so you've always got water that you can push using gravity yep. to uh, anywhere on the farm. Whereas if you were to try to push from this pond using just a pump, just the pump, you it, would have it would it be need, it, it wouldn't you be. You need possible. a huge pump to be able to do it, and mm-hmm. it would consume so much fuel to like yeah. be able to do that. The one thing that we also didn't touch on is like the temporary water temporary water system that's hooked into a rural water line is great for a whole variety of reasons that we discussed a little bit. But the something that is a huge disadvantage is the fact that you don't own that water. Yeah. And so if you get into a situation where there's like a drought and there's water like cutbacks shortages. and shortages, the first thing that people are going to, that people are, that the county or whatever is going to try to conserve is drinking water for people. And so agriculture water can get shut off. And if that's your only water source, you're completely screwed. And so it's, there, it is a huge I mean, not only like cost savings because you don't have to, you don't have to like be paying monthly your water bill. And if you have a tank that screws up and it leaks, then you're you have a two hundred dollar water bill or whatever. But the if you've got if you've got surface water or tanks that are fed by some sort of natural water source, pond, pond or whatever, or... like nobody's gonna shut that at least not yet. Nobody's gonna shut that water off unless it's a crazy Some states like. Like Pennsylvania, yeah. you can't even build the, a pond. There's, which there's, is just ridiculous. there's, there's all sorts of crazy. Like in California, has crazy water right deals and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But like, for the most part, that's an advantage of using natural water. Is that is that it's you're not paying much, for it? Yeah. And and it can't get shut off in in an extreme scenario. So something to think about for mm-hmm. sure. But but we use it. Um, and we use it a lot. And it's great. But we have other options if if something were to happen to to the water lines. But, yeah, yeah, that was a good discussion. Or yeah, good, that was good. Good topic. I'm sure we have a gazillion questions, so we're just going to scroll th- scroll through them and see what we got. So for those that don't know, this is like our new with our new format, I'm just going to reiterate it. Yeah, absolutely. We've been doing the first whatever 20 minutes or however long. We're not going to set a time, but however, however, however long it takes us mm-hmm. to explain a topic that we've chosen, which today was water. Um, we're just going to just go and just ramble, not ramble, but you know. Ramble. <laughs> ramble on about what we think yeah. about this topic. And then after we get done talking, then that's when we're going to open it up to questions. Um, and we'll know. scroll through for everybody who's Make asked sure, questions yeah. so while So if you've happening. asked a question while we're talking, we'll, we'll get to it. So. Yeah. And then, yeah, just start firing away because this is this is the part that like really enjoy being yeah. able to interact with everybody. For be- uh, blah, blah, blah. I can't talk tonight. Sorry. Healing Farm. For buried water line with quick connection, uh, quick connects in six inch PVC pipe, is there a good way to keep it from freezing in cold temperatures? Um, so with, with, with the pipe that you've got up there, as long as you've got the, your pipe or your, you know, quick coupler, your, your feeder line, your, your water line buried below the frost line, you're going to get some natural heat from the ground, keeping that pipe pretty, um, insulated. One thing you can do and Greg, Greg's talked about, and this is something that I've, I think I've talked about on here before. Yeah. Like back in Michigan, our, our frost line is like three and a half feet or something. And so with, with the way the quick coupler works, you can't reach your arm, one arm down three and a half feet, you know? So a solution to that maybe is coming, bringing a little riser up and getting the, the quick coupler up high Higher enough up. that you can r- plug into it. And then maybe using like a 12 inch pipe, you know, a bigger area that you have more, uh, more you know air, air. warm air yep. circulating through there and then also with the cap that you put over the pvc i don't know if we said it 
you, yeah, you put you, a cap, you put over, a cap over, the, over, the top, over that pipe. And then you could also put some, like, whatever, two, three inch foam inside that cap just to, just to further insulate it. Um, and maybe even put some spray foam around the pipe. Or I, I mean, yeah. You're, you're just trying to figure out a way to, like, the, the ground is an incredible insulator if you mm -hmm. can get below the frost line, and then and then you're just trying to make sure... Cold I mean, air doesn't in, get into yeah, it. Yeah, cold air doesn't get into it. I don't think in Kansas, where you guys are at, I don't think it gets crazy colder than it is here. So, I mean, maybe it does, and I'm wrong, but, like, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be totally, I wouldn't be worried about just making sure that it's below the frost line, and, and, and as long as you can reach it, you know, because if your frost line's really deep... And you can't reach it, then you're gonna, you know, start coming up with solutions like Isaac saying. But otherwise, if it's if it's in reachable distance, just you know, six inch, eight inch pipe buried in the ground, it won't freeze on you. Mm -hmm. um, um, Greg's also on some of the ponds for like those permanent tanks, where we've got a shut off above the pond or above the tank. You know, if if the tank starts leaking, we can shut the the water off so we don't drain the whole pond. Yep. A lot of those are just open-ended, which kind of blows my mind. Yeah. But we haven't had them freeze, even in the negative, whatever, yeah. 10, 15 degrees we had here. Um, and those are only two feet in the ground as well. The, the pipe is, you know, the yeah. valve is two feet in the ground. So, I I mean, that's got to be a testament to the, the yeah, ground, the, the power ground. of the ground. To yep. Keep it, keep it thawed. Yep. Uh, someone said, hello, hello. Oh. <laughs> Another wave. <laughs> We're just reading comments. All right. What what do I do if some of the pet some of the pasture is boggy and some are good? Boggy by boggy you mean like, like puggy like or wet? Wet or like actually a bog, you know? Because there, there's a difference. I mean like well, I would say universally if you've got a if you got an area that's always wet, you need to be really careful about a, you can't go in there if you've just got had a rain. You have mm -hmm. to plan your grazing around that where your drier parts of the year, try to graze that area when there's not as much water. Um, that's one part. The other part is like, if there is, if it is wet in there and it happens to be wet, you've got to spend a minimum amount of time. Like the longer you- big areas yep. and then get out of there. Yeah. So like either a huge area that includes that and other stuff and don't spend any more than like a half a day or less in there if it's really wet um or or even maybe even make it small but like like move them extremely fast like they're only in there for an hour or two or whatever mm -hmm. um and then move move them on but you just have to be monitoring the amount of um and like if they're sinking up to their elbows you don't, can't don't go in there in. then then at that point just Unless it makes up a massive portion of your of your land, which is problematic in and of itself, but if it's just like a, like an area of a paddock and it's not like critical that you have to get that forage in order to make your operation run, you might want to just treat it as like additional habitat, um, just you know like either wetland or semi riparian fence habitat it off or and whatever. Just keep them out of it. Yeah, just fence it off and let it grow up into whatever happens and. And you're going to get so many interesting like bird species and wildlife and stuff that's going to be in there that who knows the complicated relationship with your greater farm ecosystem. It could be massively improving it by having that like protected, but you can't, you can't be destroying it by letting your animals pug it. You've got to, you have to figure out a solution, but if it makes up the majority of your farm, that's tough. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's tough, but I don't know. Start grazing like you don't want to start, it. start grazing like swamp rabbits or something like that, you know, like, like something that can, something that'll be able to deal with it. <laughs> Me and my herd of swamp rabbits. <laughs> All right. When when uh when starting grazing a new field that has been hayed for years, is it in, is it more important to graze it intensively first to put the manure down tight or to graze it less intensively for the root stru structure? I would say give it a sabbatical. Yep. For and hay ground, um, it's been abused, not abused, it, but it's, it's been, been, been worked and worked and worked, worked and worked years and years. Yeah. If you give if you give it a whole growing season off and maybe come in the fall after you know, after it's kind of the growing is kind of you know petering out and then go in and strip graze it and feed some hay on it. Then you'll really get the, over the winter. You'll really get the uh, 
manure that you really need to jumpstart it, then that following year, it'll really be cranking. And But I would say the following year, again, be careful yeah. about grazing it too heavy because you yeah. have to think about, it's almost like that area has been like heavily grazed in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Like it's been overgrazed in perpetuity because it's been hayed. You know what I mean? So you've got to, that land is just like screaming for some sort of rest, like after just constantly being cut and cut and cut and cut and cut. And so that's what you got to give it. You got to give it rest and then always be managing height really carefully in that yeah, field, especially in the residual. beginning. Yeah. And then once you, you'll, you'll see it change. Like once, like, like I feel like hay field is something that, that, that it's, I mean, it's going to be easier to turn around than a crop field Oh yeah. because you've already got that grass there. Um, so and more than likely a sod. Yeah, exactly. So just just manage your height, and and you'll know. Like once it once it starts to turn around and it's just cranking, then then and you just just treat it like yeah, like a normal pasture. But just be super careful in the beginning about getting that stuff grazed too short. I would err on the side of light versus heavy, for sure. Yes. All right. For the deep riser and quick coupler situation, would it work to just have a black? top for it to act as a solar heat to warm it during idea. the day yeah that's that's a good idea yeah, that's a good idea um, um the reason why you have a cap on it is so that like i mean a number of reasons but the, you don't want like animals falling in there because it, it happens and the stuff that we don't have caps for uh, uh greg's stuck his hand down in there before and there's like a dead possum in there it's definitely not what you're looking forward to like grabbing a hold of in a dark hole. Um, so pulling out pieces of it. Yeah. Time. I've pulled out like a decayed something or other out of one of them. It was just bones. Like that was it, bones. Uh, Minuses, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah I it was that. like a squirrel or something that fell in there and it was just, yeah, it was like dust. Lovely. And bones. But yeah, put a cap on it. <laughs> you won't have any surprises, but it also like just keeps that quick coupler or valve or whatever, like a lot Warm. cleaner. And warmer in the winter time. Yep, in the winter time. But yeah, a black cap is a good idea. Yeah. You know, if the sun gets out, yep. it's gonna really warm that up. It just make sure that you've got some sort of post there so you know where it's at. Mm -hmm. Because the white shows up really well, but we also usually have posts so Greg doesn't hit it with his brush hog, which sometimes or tractor or sometimes tire. still happens. But yeah. But um but yeah, just make sure you but like seriously for your own sake that you're not wandering around trying to find it, like find the place where you're connecting it. Just drive a steel post or a fiberglass rod or something like that in there. Or a... Uh, Spray paint it a bright color so yeah, you can see it. A flag or A flag, something. something like that. But the cattle will rub on it, so just, just be Keep aware. Yeah. Fastest way to turn poor, bankrupt soil around the fat, around the fastest. How do you guys manage areas with honey, honey locusts? That's a different... So, <laughs> so poor, bankrupt soil, like how do you, how do you turn that around quickly? Um, a... It depends on like with the hay situation, like rest is always a good idea right off the bat. If it's been used, like if that soil has been used heavily, cropped or yeah. hayed or something like that, that's always something to keep in mind. If it's been like CRP and it's just been Resting, idle, um, you can you can strip graze yep. in the winter time, feed hay and you know strip along. You can kind of if you if you want to do this, you can also give them a an energy tub and just you can make them eat the the residual or like the the uh for people who don't know what an energy tub is it's like like a protein lick or something it's something like that'll help them break down that fiber super fibrous like heavy carbohydrate load from the from the over the mature forage called, yeah, yeah it's basically like eating like eating like you know mm -hmm. like straw like woody sticks or whatever mm -hmm. so in order to metabolize it they need protein so you'd give them a protein like whatever but i understand people who aren't super yeah and i don't know if i'd be super super keen on that, keen on that i would rather feed hay on it and just make them beat the crap out of it you know feed a lot of hay yep. and they would really they need a little bit of the thatch but they'd trample a bunch of it into the into but the yeah making sure you feed excessive hay and get high density mm -hmm. um in the winter, in the time. winter time would is really going to help like juice that thing up and turn it around in the right direction that's that that's what i would do mm -hmm. and just be patient i'm convinced that like given enough time you could you could create like grass on top of bare rock if, lava yeah freshly like freshly we were cooled, talking about this like, i think freshly cooled lava flow right so just pure <laughs> rock if you if you bought in a crazy amount of hay and just and just went full full feed hay tiny areas and just heavy manure and hay trampled into the manure you're basically making compost like right mm -hmm. there on the spot 
and you got tons of seed involved or whatever. It might take a couple of years to get the grasses established, but once they were there, I mean, it would take few, a long time. Even, I mean, yeah. just like like a yeah. patch of it, just to hold that yeah. down, like because it, it could like a road. Because yeah, because as soon as you get as soon as you get a rain, it's gonna come washing right off. But I think you. But if if you could if you could grow something on lava rock, like you could do it anywhere. So mm -hmm. I'm convinced that that's like the way to go. If you're it's just a, like like I said, you just gotta be patient and it'll take time. Yep. People get in this hurry. Oh, I I want I want to make my you know I want to really get like this. Greg Judy. I want to yeah. get this going. It's like, yeah, but Greg Judy didn't have a farm like Greg Judy in twenty years ago. You know, it took it took, took that time. It took that time to, to get it going. To get it. To and some it environments going. are less forgiving than here mm -hmm. as far as like turning that thing around. So mm -hmm. just sure. keep that in mind. And how do you guys manage areas with honey locusts? Honey locust is a funny one. Yeah. Um, because it's it's it gets a lot of hate. It's a lot of hate, but it's also really good. Like sometimes. Yeah, but like the plant itself is like purpose built for mm, cattle for for grazing systems. I think it's a oh what is the what is the word? It's, it's a nitrogen a, fixer. It fixes nitrogen. It's an anachronism. I think is what it's called. It's it's like a it's like a living fossil, as in like it it existed. I think. I could be wrong if there's some plant nerds out there, but it basically like it's, it basically existed back. It, ex it existed back when there were like large, large herbivores like roaming around, and so it's yeah. purpose built for, like you know the the struggles of growing in a in a pasture with three hundred large herbivores. With, um, uh, yeah, with mastodons. And yeah, or whatever. But like you know, the cattle rub on any like tree or sapling that's in there. But if the thing has giant thorns on it, they don't like to rub on it. So it gets well established. It does well in like full sunlight. Mm -hmm. It it has like dappled shade, like indirect shade. So your grasses will actually grow well, like underneath the underneath the shade of the tree. Um, it fixes nitrogen. It fixes nitrogen. <laughs> the pods are very high in energy, so they're super the seed, yeah, palatable. Seed, seed pods are, are and also... Good for wildlife and cattle yep, and such. Also good forage. The um, It does really well in like high manure, like high nitrogen loads and like soil compaction. So a lot of the time, if you've got a stand of honey locust in the middle of a field, that's where the cattle are going to gravitate towards in the summertime, especially because of the shade. And if you have any other kind of tree in there other than like a honey locust... They're, they're gonna probably die if you don't really carefully manage how much time they're spending under that tree. But the honey locust just, it just does fine. Like it doesn't seem to bother it at all to mm -hmm. have like lots of excess manure and lots of like compaction from like the hoofs of like 350 head milling around there all day. Um, so like th that piece of like the whole puzzle, like it's an awesome tree to have mm -hmm. in your pasture. The thing why people have like a war against honey locusts is because of the thorns. Yeah. Oh, they're nasty to they're, deal with. They're they're so nasty to deal with. Like they're nasty to cut. They're nasty to stack. They puncture tires like so easily. We get a lot of flies. For people who aren't familiar, like they can have thorns that are like that long. And, and they're like solid. Solid, like really. I mean, it's like wood. It's heavily lignified and incredibly sharp, like sewing needle sharp. Um, it's actually pretty impressive, but yeah, it is. <laughs> but um, so people will try to get rid of them, and granted, you don't want your whole farm turning into like a honey locust patch, and so like there's a couple different ways I guess you could manage them. We obviously like you could spray them, but that's not something that we're interested in doing at all. Um, using you know using herbicides to try to so solve something like that. I think what you like your your best bet is. If you have an area that has a high concentration of honey locusts, like it's a whatever, like a small corner of a pasture or something like that, you could that's a really good application for a brush hog where you could go in there in the summertime and just knock off those like little saplings as they're coming up. Um, and if you do that over and over and over again in that same heavy, heavy spot, like heavy um, uh, honey locust area or whatever, you're going to weaken the plant enough that eventually it'll die. And it's pretty low effort on your part. If they're interspersed throughout a field, this is something that we've talked about before. Where like in in the like the Greg's school of thought would be for a number of reasons. It's not just for the honey locust. It, it's it's a lot more layered than that. But he would he would decide to just brush hog the whole paddock that has like a higher amount of honey locusts in it to just knock that down. Um, 
and make the forge more palatable and make it look better for the yeah, landowner, etc. There's a lot of layers to it. It's not just for the honey locust, but regardless, it does help with the honey locusts in that way. We're, I personally am more on the camp of trying to minimize the amount of brush hogging. So I would say the best way to do it is to just spend a honey, do a honey locust day on a paddock and just walk the paddock back and forth with a pair of loppers or if they're close enough together, you could use like a brush trimmer, like, you know, like one of those, what do you call them, ninja stars or whatever, mm -hmm. but like a like brush a weed, blade on, weed a, on, a, on a, a weed eater blade. or a weed whacker, whack those dudes off, um, a machete if you wanted to be, yeah, want to have some fun. Um, but yeah, just, just go and cut them down. Rambo. If you don't want them to grow up. But what I would say is like, think strategically because sometimes like shade is a valuable resource in a paddock. And so mm -hmm. if you've got a honey locust growing there and there's not many around it, and it'd be great to have a shade tree, just let it go. Mm -hmm. Like, let it grow up into a shade tree and just be careful when you're driving around in the paddock. You know, that's what I would do. Yeah. They are, I mean, like you said, with just the fact that they can withstand the cattle. I mean, yeah. just purpose built for the purpose cattle. Built. It's like, yeah. There's so few trees if, that if, can if do that. Can, if, yeah. If you, yeah. Can, if you can get over the fact that, yeah, they have thorns that'll eat you alive. Yeah. It's a good, it's, it's a, a good it's tree a to good have. It's a good tree to have. I have, I have a special place in my heart for the honey locust. An oak tree is not going <laughs> to no. withstand what a honey locust is. And even though an oak tree is a beautiful tree, yeah. it's not something you want to have. And, in the but if pasture. you do want to get like, you know, whatever, walnut or oak or like something like growing in your pasture like that, it like you can do it. It's just when you they're little, you've got to put cages around them and make sure that the cattle can't access them. And um, you'd want to make sure they don't... Yeah, then it's not just a single oak tree in the middle of the paddock. Yeah, we know, got one of those. Like I was, I was just thinking while we were talking here, while you're talking, um, in a scenario like with civil pasture, you know, yep, that's where I think those kind of trees thrive is like when you've got a lot of shade, yep. mixed in with the grass, and so you're not getting like that heavy, yeah, dense animal density, yep. on a s single tree. You know, when you it's, say when you say would thrive, you're talking about about oaks, oaks, oaks yeah, yeah, yeah. and walnuts yeah. and like hardwoods, yep, um, yep, because then it's like you know it's not concentrating that that impact. like the shade is spread out over yep. the whole paddock. I think that'd be a super cool thing for. Yep. those kind of trees um but the honey locust does a lot better if it's it like the single open. tree mm -hmm. out in an open pasture think about like the uh like, think oh, about like acacia not, yeah. acacia trees in africa like mm -hmm. that it's like the same like it's the same role you know yeah. what i mean and i think the i think the the latin name is robinia pseudo acacia i'm pretty sure that's the latin name for honey locust so or robina or whatever but pseudo acacia is kind of funny it's like Okay, like kind of, it's like it's like fake acacia tree. You know what I mean? So anyway, I'm cheap American version. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, those thorns are not a knockoff. No, though. they're not. What's oh. funny is that there's a lot of like hybridization with honey locust trees where they're uh, heavily used like um, horticulture species, and so they've developed, you know, not developed, but they've bred and and so, and will select for thornless honey locusts. And so it'll be planted in people's yards or whatever. And then there's wild honey locusts in this part of the country. And so you get this mixing. And so you'll get some honey locust trees that have minimum thorns, like very few, and they're not, not that nasty. And you get some that's like thorns on top of thorns on top of thorns. Yeah. And you have none, some that have zero, like they're completely thornless. And so it's just cool. Like they're, they got some personality. I don't know. Yeah. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of the honey I, locusts. Yeah. I'm a fan. I just... It sucks dealing with them. Oh, like, yeah. As far as, like, if you have to cut one down. Yeah, or, we just got to be careful. You just got to be careful. And just use also, a grapple. And, yeah, and just, yeah, use a grapple and, and just, if you have a tractor and a lot of honey locust, fill your tires with rubber. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, next question. That was a good one, though. Yeah. Realistically, what's the max number of days the cattle should be uh, come back to a single water source before they move on to the next one? That's a good question. What's the max number of days that the cattle could come back to a single water source without moving on to the next one? It's like, was it two or three days, probably? For for us here? Well, I mean, that you should probably... It depends on the water source. If you're talking like a creek, or, you know, if, if they're like having to wade down a creek bank, you really yeah. don't want them... They're, they're, they're going to camp out there if it's in the heat of the summer. Yep. So... I would say a day or two, you wouldn't really want them there for a, yeah. that much longer. You don't want them standing there for a week. I mean, if it's, I don't want to say you you can't because if it's if it's it like you know every situation is different, and if you can only move your cattle once a week, yeah, then you know 
you got you got you got to adjust it to your lifestyle. But yeah, um, that's the case with any advice that, that we yeah. give. It's like it's it, all this stuff is so situationally dependent, yep. and that's a huge, a huge, hugely common thread with this this whole deal. Like you know, when we're talking to people about oh, what should I do with this? What should I do with that? It's like we can give you suggestions based on our experiences, but it's unless really we're right. on the ground looking at it with you, it's like. It's, it's a little tricky to give you the perfect advice unless you live like, you know, somewhere very similar. But, mm -hmm. but I would say, like here, we don't usually, so like those permanent tanks that we were talking about, there's like three paddocks or four paddocks that those are servicing. So they'll be coming back to the water tank for what, two, three, four days sometimes. But it's like from a different way. Yep. As far as like temporary water, we're moving that every mm -hmm. time without, every move without, or moving that like every move or every other move yep. to keeping it caught up with the cattle yeah and like as far as like coming back to a pond for drinking i would say here not more than a day and a half yeah. usually but it's just it's just here it's not like you can't yeah it's just that's that's what we do it's, here it's just gonna they're gonna the longer you leave them there the more they're gonna you know impact that but that's talking 370 head maybe you have 20 head and that's you're not it's not it you're much. not gonna have that much of an issue you could leave them there longer too yeah so. Yeah, or if your ground is rock hard, or a lot yeah. of sand, or, or a lot of sand, but you wouldn't have ponds if you had a lot of yeah, sand. Yeah, but, but but, it, but you might have like a spring, a creek, or something. Yeah, too. yeah, something like that. Yep. All right. For black pipe across the ground with a quick connect, uh, we were moving it to move our water around. But in the summer, that water was super hot in the tank. Got any ideas on how to keep it drinkable? So. A lot of, so the, the one that we have on the ground, the grass covers has it. grown up over it and it keeps it shaded during the summer heat. Yeah. Um, what would I do? I'd bury it. I, um, I would bury it. But but sometimes you can't because, yeah. because it's a piece of leased land that you're not totally sure if. on how long you're going to have it for. And the advantage of having it on top of the ground is that you can roll it up if you had to leave that lease. If you can run it underneath permanent fence lines you know maybe you have like some paddock, paddock divisions, divisions or something if you can run it underneath there a lot of times there's more grass growing in the fence lines and you can maybe cover it up yeah um, with that because if you can get some shade on it it's gonna keep it a lot a cooler. lot cooler yeah. um and if if the water is it depends on how far you're pushing it but if the water tank is right next to where the cattle are they're going to be drinking enough very, very uh, often, yeah, frequently. frequently. And so they're going to keep fresh water coming in to that tank. Um, yeah. And in the hottest days of the summer, you're probably still going to get some warm water. But um, that's that's what I would say. Yeah, at least they've got water. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. And if you're if you're closer. If you're closer to where the water is coming from, you know, yeah. if it's coming at coming from a hydrant or whatever, like the water's gonna be colder. Mm -hmm. The the longer it has to travel in a hot pipe, the hotter it's gonna get. So mm -hmm. something else to think about. That I don't know, but just some thoughts. Mm -hmm. I said five hundred feet with a black. Five hundred feet's not that far. Yeah. But I could see if you don't have enough flow. It getting really really hot. If it's yeah. Just baking oh yeah. If it's just sun. sitting there. Yeah. The if you ever tried to drink out of a garden hose in the summertime? It's hot. That first bit of water is scalding hot. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, in the summertime, one time we were at a family uh, family cookout kind of deal, and me and my brother and my two cousins, we were all kind of about the same age, and we uh, had our swimming trunks on, and we had like a slip and slide or something, but. <laughs> Anyways, always a good time. <laughs> I don't know where. Yeah. So where's the story? Going? We went and we jumped in a mud hole out in the woods. Yeah. We got just absolutely covered in mud. Um, and we had to hose off. And the first person to get hosed off had the best because the water was still warm. It was warm, yeah. Once that that water got that hose cool, yeah. The other three people, it was cold. cold water. Water. That's funny. But yeah. Anyways. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jack Spurko in Texas has gotten his property growing on rock with ducks. Ha. Ducks. ducks. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, grazing. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. I love I feel duck. Like I've heard of them. It's like it to eat. So, I don't know. Fun fact. <laughs> 
I wonder what, because the ducks can be kind of, they're kind of grazers. Like, they need yeah. a little bit of supplemental grain. Yeah, they but, do. But they, they eat a good portion of their diet as forage. Yeah, like more than I wonder what more they're, chickens. Because, like, chicken manure is super high in nitrogen. You know, it's, like, very, what you call hot. It's high in nitrogen. It's got a high nitrogen to carbon nitrogen ratio or, to, or a low carbon to nitrogen ratio or whatever. It's like seven to one or something. Seven carbon to one nitrogen. And I wonder what ducks said that if it's it'd be seven nitrogen to to one to one carbon if it was if it was hot, wouldn't it? I don't know. No, just because then it's like thirty two to one is like the carbon to nitrogen that you want because you want more carbon than nitrogen because yeah. nitrogen is like oh oh I see what you're saying yeah. I see what you're saying yeah 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 okay yeah don't mind me <laughs> I was like, don't mind I, me I think yeah I think I was fucking right. Um, I see what you're saying with that. Uh, I you're what talking ducks, about yeah, I wonder what duck, ducks. Uh, how, I bet it's I bet it's a high, little less it's, than it's higher, but not as hot as chicken. Mm -hmm. Hot yeah. as chicken. Hot um, chicken. Hot chicken. Um, chicken yeah. with chickens. So the thing you got to think about, chickens are probably one of the quickest land turnaround that you can get just because of that nitrogen like yeah. you'll see the most impact on your forage the fastest the fastest but the chicken isn't really it's not because the chicken's grazing right necessarily. and, and yeah. you gotta think of you're hauling in the grain to the chickens and so that grain is like that boost of, yep. of nutrients that you're putting then onto the land yep. so it's like it's kind of like with supplemental hay like we do here you know yep. you're buying it in putting it on the land and you're growing it yeah um Yep. It's just like different, but it's kind of, you know, yeah. something to think about. Something to think about. Jack Sperko has a YouTube channel. He has videos on it since he moved there. Really cool. I think I've seen. I don't recognize videos. the name, but I've seen some duck stuff. Yeah, I've seen yeah. some duck stuff. I don't know. I'll check it out. Yeah. Any clue if it's possible to bury a, wa a water line through a non-paved roadway to get water across a non-paved public road? Probably not possible, but it would be nice. So there's a, you could, if you can find a culvert, yeah, that's, that's a good way to go. That's how we'll, we'll transport electricity from farm to farm too, is going under a culvert. Um, you could run a water line under a culvert if you got it like yeah situated properly and there's not a crazy amount of water coming through there usually. Um, I don't the, know, or a bridge or something, any, any kind of, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you could do it that way. I don't think you in can. the dead of night you could do dig a hole. I'm not I'm not suggesting do this. This is a joke <laughs> because I don't want to. I don't want. I'm not personally responsible, responsible for, any. <laughs> for any actions. In the dead of night you could just take a trencher and go <laughs> and throw the line in, and bury it back up again. They wouldn't know it. They have no idea. Um. Yeah. No, it's probably not a good idea. Get you a garden roller and got it with your lawnmower and rolling it compact. <laughs> You could go up. Maybe you could go up with it. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't do that either. No, don't do that either. No, I mean, That's in all seriousness, though, there was one scenario where Greg actually was able to do that. And, or, no, 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 not with water. It was with, it was with electricity. They were bearing, they were putting in a water meter for him. Yep. They had, the, the count, or like the county or whoever, the water people, they had dug a trench. He came up to him, hey, uh, you guys just care if I put a, a wire in there? And they're like, yeah, sure, whatever. Before you know, before you bear it, can I put it? And he snuck this uh, PVC. I think it's PVC, rigid PVC pipe yeah. in the same trench, so that if if someday um, <laughs> the water, the the rural water ever gets too expensive, he could uh, he could go over there and he could connect to that rigid PVC and run it and then put a pump in his pond. He could pump pressurized water across the road, across to, the the road, road. to the other one. <laughs> he did, they didn't know he put that in there. Yeah, they just thought because that they were putting in the water line. Yeah, he was gonna be paying. For he was it. gonna that be was like his it. way to get out of it. Be, but the yeah, the they thought the PVC pipe was just something to do this weird electricity thing. But yeah. Anyway, funny Greg. Yeah. yeah. Um, how we doing? Is that basically it? We're we're caught up on questions. I think what we're gonna wrap it? it up. I think that's about an hour. Yeah. Um, we've gone. That was a good discussion. I think a lot of a lot. questions too. Um, it's an interesting topic. Water is the very much the lifeblood of the farm for sure. You can't live without it. Nothing can live without it. The grass can't live without it. The cow can't live without it. And the other interesting thing too to think about as well, we'll sort of end with this, is the fact that like your animals are also acting like a like a 
like an irrigation system oh, yeah. for your for your property as well and it becomes super apparent in really arid environments because you're it's like you have a bunch of sprinklers out there that are that are filling up with water at your water point and then they're going and urinating all over your property and if you the if the land is not used to getting a lot of rain your the the results of doing that are like are crazy plus um, if you think about it it's got you know urea in yeah, that water so yeah. it's like it's like it's like yeah. go-go juice yeah exactly i mean it's mostly water but but you're right there's there's but there there's all sorts of good stuff in there for sure but that that irrigation factor is something that people don't think about a lot because your cows are drinking like 25 gallons yeah, of water this, a day this, in the heat of the day a thousand summer. pound cow would drink 30 gallons or whatever and, and so gallons. so like think about like you know that times that times 300 i mean you're talking some serious water that's getting because i mean Six. obviously they, they absorb some of it but they pee a lot of it out um Six thousand. Does that sound right? I I'm not even gonna attempt. Six like six thousand gallons. Yeah. A day. But and they absorb some percentage. But yeah. But it's like. Yeah, so let's just say five thousand. But day. anyway, yeah, it, it's a lot of water. So it's something to think about too. It's not just like you're watering your animals. You're also watering your landscape, doing like you through know, the animal. Through the animal. So, the more access to water you can give them, the more hydrated your landscape is gonna be. In a really like non-brittle environment, like here. The results of that, you can't really see very much, but if you're in an area that doesn't get a lot of annual rainfall, like it's, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. So something to think about. Yeah. All right. Good Wrap discussion. That was a good one. Um, we'll be here next week. Same, same time, same place. Um, next week's discussion will be, I think it's another infrastructure discussion, but I'll, I'll check on that. But Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, the episode from last week will be up on YouTube before Tuesday. I'm going to finish it up um, tomorrow, um, and that will be up. So I'll make a post about that. So stay tuned. All right. See everybody next week.